We have, from Thrive It Financial, Larry Dolan. So please welcome Larry Dolan with our financial advice for ethical people. Thank you. You know, kind of a funny thing. Um, I recently met an attorney who uh, moved to the villages from Washington, D.C. And she told me that um, in Washington, D.C., attorneys are a dime a dozen, um, but not financial advisors. When she moved to the villages, she found that uh, financial advisors are a dime a dozen, but not so much attorneys, which is kind of why she moved here in the first place. Um, when there's that many financial advisors, and it just makes sense because there's a lot of people who move down here. They have significant assets when they move down here. They are abandoning their former financial advisor, so they're looking for someone they can meet with face-to-face, -face, hopefully they can trust. And of course, everybody wants to be that guy that they can trust and do business with. Um, you know, I've never seen another place quite like the villages, and I say that because on any given month in the villages, there are 78 financial seminars that are being given where a meal is provided. I tell people all the time, if you are very careful and strategic, you may never have to, you may never have to cook another meal again. We call it the village's meal plan. Um, but here's the thing. These, of course, are seminars are designed uh, to gain money, gain assets, and profits. And that's okay. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. But too often they go overboard. Uh, if you've ever been to these, you can probably verify that at some point they will pull out a nice, big, glossy color brochure. Why do they do that? Well, they do that because they're trying to sell you that product in that brochure. Well, that's not only a little bit unseemly, but it's kind of unethical. Here's the thing. If they don't know your goals, your financial state of being, your family situation, they have no business recommending anything. But they're probably pushing a product that's very profitable to them. It'd be like going to a physician. My wife's a physician, so I sometimes use uh, medical analogies. It'd be like going to a doctor for a checkup. And the doctor doesn't ask you any questions, doesn't consult with any um, charts whatsoever, doesn't run any tests, and says, you know, I think you need to be under, on Lipitor. What? How does he know? You know, n probably none of us would put up with that with our doctors, but too often people do put up with that with their financial advisors, and they shouldn't. You know, we mentioned, um, the villages, and my wife is a physician at the BA clinic here in the villages. And one of my clients said to me, you know, Larry, I go to the BA clinic in the villages, but my doctor has a foreign accent. I said, well, so does my wife. She's from Alabama. <laughs> she didn't think it was too funny either. <laughs> uh, but the um, name of my company, as you can see, is Thriving Financial, combining faith and finances for good. Faith and finances, you know, it's odd. A lot of people uh, think of that as a... Um, contradiction in terms. But it really isn't if you consider it. Um, can anyone here tell me what the number one uh, secular subject covered in the Bible is? Money. Yeah. That surprises some folks. And you know, people will actually misquote the Bible to me. I've heard people say to me, you know, Larry, the good book says money is the root of all evil. Is that what it says? No. It's the love of money. Yeah. There's another term for the love of money. Greed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, here's by itself, money is not good or bad, it's a tool. Now it can be used for good, look at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, look at the money that goes to fund mission missionaries uh, or missions abroad. Um, it can be certainly used for good, but it can also be used for bad as well, bad purposes. And our industry has been plagued with that type of greed. Bernie Madoff, Enron, Global Funding, Tyco, U.S. Healthcare. The list of rogue characters goes on and on. So it's very important to pick a financial advisor that you can trust because there's a lot of them out there, unfortunately, that you cannot trust. That's a little bit about myself. You can see I'm a graduate of Tulane University in New Orleans. And yes, I do make a mean jambalaya. I have now 12 years experience in financial services. I've been with Thriving Financial since 2011, member of the National Association of investment and financial associates. I have my Series 7 and Series 66 uh, securities license, life accident health, and annuities license in five different states.
As reading, reading and writing were essential to participate in society in the past, today you have to be financially literate. The financial model has changed over the years. What do I mean by that? The model used to be you graduate either from high school or college, get a job, work the same job for 30, 40 years, you retire, get a gold watch from the company, live off the company pension for about 10 or 15 years, then you die and life insurance pays for your burial. Is that the way it is today? Not even close. Today, most people don't just have one job for the majority of their career. Most companies don't provide pensions anymore. Uh, so there's, the model has changed and therefore your choices have changed. Unfortunately, a lot of people haven't changed with it. Um, well, the reason I say that is because there's even more of a premium these days on being financially literate, of knowing what to do financially, because not, it's not laid out to you like it used to be in the past. And sometimes the decisions that you make may not be the, the best financial decision. So there's a premium on making good financial decisions. And if you don't know, you need to cut, consult someone that is trustworthy and competent to help you with those decisions. Give me an example, Elvis. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Give me, Elvis Presley, when he passed away, his estate was worth $10 million. That was when a million dollars was really a million dollars. By the time it got to Priscilla, it has shrunk to 2.7 million. That's a shrinkage of 70%. That's huge. John D. Rockefeller, on the other hand, when he passed away, his estate was worth half a billion dollars. When he bet, when his heirs got it, there was only a three and a half percent shrinkage. So both men were quite wealthy in their day. This one had a 70% shrinkage. This one only had a three and a half percent shrinkage. What was the difference? One was knowledgeable and one wasn't about finances. What you don't know can cost you money, and in their case, it's cost them a lot of money. So I put together this test so that you can kind of gauge your own level of financial competency. And it's only four questions, um, so it's not that complicated. But these are the basic things that people should know these days. Number one, someone has deposited $10,000 in an FDIC-insured bank account. Over the years, it's earned 1000 in interest. So they started with ten. It earned a thousand. If the bank were to fail, how much would the FDIC pay the account holder? A zero, B ten thousand, C eleven thousand. How many say zero? How many say ten thousand? How many say eleven thousand? The answer is ten thousand. Yeah. FDIC stands for Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. It only covers your deposits, not your earnings. A lot of people are surprised to, to learn that. And by the way, statutorily. They can wait 10 years to give them the money. They never have, but they can wait 10 years. Number two, you invest 10,000 in stocks. The stock's trading price declines 40% in the first year and rises 40% in the second year. As a result, you have A, lost money, B, made money, or C, broken even. How many th th would suggest that you had lost money? How many say you made money? How many say you broke even? Okay, the answer is you lost money. Yeah, start with 10,000 and lose 40%. That's 4,000. Now you're down to six. Now you gain 40% of six. What's 40% of six? 2,400. So now you're at 8,400. So you've lost 1,600. Did this ever happen? Yeah, in 2008, depending on how you're invested, the market could have gone down 40%. 2009, it went back up around 40%. People said, well, what happened? How come I'm not back to where I was? That's one of the big reasons right there. Which country is now the United States' largest trading partner? Anyone like to guess? It's not multiple choice. <laughs> China. China? Anyone else like to guess? I say China. China? Okay. Most people do say China. It's actually Canada. Yeah. China's number two. It had just passed in, uh, five years ago the European Union to become number two. It's the fastest growing trading partner, but it's still Canada's number one. Understand this. Canada and U.S. share a 3,000-mile border. They both have high standard of living on both sides, so there's a lot of trade going through. And they, they have very few tariffs in place, now even less than they did before. So, uh, yeah, it's still Canada number one. Go to three. <laughs> uh, how did y'all do with the quiz? My goodness, what happened there? <laughs>
So people say to me all the time, how do we um, know if a company is um, a person or a company is ethical to deal with? There are a couple of resources you can go with. Number one is the ethosphere. And um, they rate companies based on their ethical performance. And not only just in the United States, but also worldwide. So they look at the 5,000 biggest companies in the world, and they give them a rating on whether they're ethical or not. And out of 5,000, 132 were deemed to, be, to behave ethically. That doesn't say too much about today's modern business, does it? And you can see in the financial services, only four made their list. By the way, notice that there's not a single Wall Street firm there. So you do have to be selective. Locally, the Senior Safety Club, I think, is a very good start where to look for, for ethical companies. Now, we always give out these red flags to avoid because there's some very enticing offers out there, but there's some you want to walk past and not take advantage of. Number one, excessive fees. Interestingly, Allianz did a survey among investors and in that survey, these are people who invest money in the market. 68% could not tell you exactly what fees they were paying. 68%. And before you shake your head too much, I've looked at some statements, and they are very well hidden. Um, first of all, they have to be listed, but they only have to be listed once a year, not quarterly, not on all your statements. And they do not have to add them all together. So if you have different fees, unless you sit there and add them up, sometimes you don't know what they are. Um, I was with a client not too long ago, and I'm not gonna mention the company that she's with, but it's a company I used to work for before I, I changed into Thriving. And um, I said, uh, do you know what you're being charged in fees? No, I don't. And I said, um, let me ask you this. If you were to call them up and say, what fees am I being charged? Do you think that's a reasonable question? Yeah, why don't you do that? So she did right there, called them up. And I could hear the guy on the other line, and he was saying, uh, well, it depends. It's kind of complex. You wouldn't answer her. And then he, uh, he, he, she said, um, look, I've been with you for three years. I think you should tell me what fees they are. And she said, he said, uh, Gladys, if you don't trust me now, then you might as well just take your money and, and leave. She says, okay. <laughs> she did. I think that's a reasonable question. But by the way, whatever answer they give you, the follow-up question should be, can I get that in writing, please? And if they hesitate, that's a really bad sign. As long as they don't want you to know what they're, be, what they're charging you. Number two, misleading claims. That happens all the time. Um, there's not a day goes by that I don't see some type of misleading claims, either in, in print media or on television, but it, it's there constantly. How many of you have seen the commercial where they say, insurance companies, for example, they'll say, uh, no tests to take, no health exam, you're guaranteed accepted, um, your rates can never change. Well, that's technically true, but it's misleading. Because here's the thing, on a standard life insurance policy, you put in a premium at, at X amount, the death benefit should be much higher. Isn't that how life insurance works? Except, this is not standard life insurance that these people are getting. It is something called final expense insurance that Tony mentioned. On final expense insurance, if you put in, let's say, 10,000 deposit, your death benefit's gonna be 10,000. Um, but they don't explain that there. I had a woman once who put 70,000 into a life insurance policy. Uh, her death benefit was 170,000. That's the type of growth you expect for those death benefits, but not for this particular type, but they don't tell you that. How many of you have seen the one where they say, if you pass away, you get the death benefit, and if you don't pass away, you get all your premiums back free. How many of you have heard that one? Okay. It's on TV a lot. Um, maybe you're not watching the same channel as I am. But here's the thing. Um, that's called a return of premium rider. Most life insurance companies have that. They're acting like this is unique. Our company has several policies like that. You can add that rider. You know, most people don't do it. You know why? That rider adds cost to it. And sometimes it can cost, depending on the amount you put in, roughly 2 to 3%. Well, you can take that money and put it in an investment and make more than that. But they make it seem like there's something special with it. So you gotta be careful with that. Another thing, in the newspaper, I always see guaranteed 6% interest, or guaranteed 6%. Let me ask you this. In this low interest rate environment, do you think anyone's really guaranteeing 6%? You know what they're doing? 
They're allowing you to do a 6% withdrawal per year. So you put your money in there, you can take out 6% a year. But they're trying to rope people into coming in with that high rate and then trying to talk them into what they're selling. It's technically true, but it's misleading. It's legal, but it's not ethical. There you go, yeah. Um, here's another thing. Bottom of the issue, single bonds, paying 4.5%. Again, that should be a red flag. A bond paying 4.5%, really? If you look at the details, this particular bond had a maturity date of 2034. I, mean, I don't know many young people that live that long. <laughs> so if you take it out before maturity, what's happened? Does anyone know? You redeem it at a discount. That means you sell it for a loss. But this looks good. So you got to look between the lines a lot. Again, all truthful, but very misleading. Unaware of potential solutions. Let me ask you all, now I know there's only three of you, how many of you have ever heard of a QLAC? How many heard of a modified endowment contract? So how would you know if those are good solutions for you or not? Again, educating yourself is key, or having someone that you trust to educate you. That's also very key. There are a myriad of solutions out there, but if you don't know about them, how would you know if they're even good for you or not? Number four, doesn't reflect your values. I'll give you an example. The 18th largest company in America, I will not mention their name, um, three years ago they were hit with a 10 billion, with a B, fine from the Justice Department for malfeasance. A month later, their CEO got a $5 million bonus. In what world does that make sense? I guess they were grateful that no one went to jail. But I knew someone who had his money invested with them. And I said to them, how do you feel about that? He says, I don't like it, Larry. He says, but they've done a good job for me managing my money. If you get nothing else from this, understand you don't have to compromise your values to make money. There are companies that do very well making money that are ethical. You just have to know who they are. Here's a red flag. No one should ever invest in blank. Um, you know, I believe that most financial advisors are generally ethical. You know, the Bernie Madoffs of the world are probably, I think, the exception. But there's one bias that's really hard to get past. Do you think someone's gonna recommend something that they don't sell? I rarely see that. Um, there was a um, email blast I got from Fisher Investments. And they said, 19 reasons why you should never invest in an annuity. They left out the 20th reason, and I think it's the most important one, they don't sell annuities. So, of course they don't want you to buy annuity. On the other hand, there are companies, and I've only seen this in the villages, all they sell is annuities, nothing else. So if you go in there and wanting a financial solution, what do you think they're gonna offer you? Maybe an annuity, I don't know, call me crazy. Uh, is annuity always a good uh, investment? No. Is it always a bad investment? No, it depends on the person. It depends on your situation. But what you, what you have to look at is when people say, always do this or never do this, there's probably something wrong with that statement. There's probably a back reason for that, and it's probably based on their uh, offerings. Another thing is mutual funds. We'll have investors. Now, for those of you who don't know, mutual funds are a basket full of investments within one fund. So it's very diversified. There is, by law, it has to be managed by a fund manager of some kind. So what I've seen, and I just sh I shake my head, someone who does brokerage, and, and they'll charge a fee for the brokerage, usually one, one and a half percent. And all it is in that brokerage account is mutual funds. Those are funds that are already managed. But he's putting his management fee on top of it. <laughs> uh, but the people don't know. So again, you gotta look between the lines. Now we mentioned annuities, and that's kind of a pet peeve of mine because I've never, in this area, annuities are really pushed hard. I can't tell you how many people, and I'm not gonna mention the name of the company, they got a lot of billboards, uh, they're very well known, they tried to get me to work for them. And they mentioned all this money that I could make the first year, and I said, well, if you're making that kind of money, what kind of fees are you charging? And he said, well, about four and a half to eight percent. I almost fell off my chair. I've never charged four and a half to eight percent. And they hide the fees very well. The way they do it is they add right. And every time you add a ride, you add a feed. And again, you don't have to add them all up. A lot of people have no idea what they're paying for these annuities. 
Uh, and I'm going to let people say who have visited them, Larry, on my variable annuity, I'm getting a guaranteed 6%. No, you're not. <laughs> um, but they think they are. Why? Well, here's the thing. Annuities are complex, so it's easy to hide some things uh, because people generally don't know the difference. So on a variable annuity, it will go up and down in the market. That's why it's called a variable. However, there is a, a guaranteed death benefit, and there is an income that you can uh, take out of it, kind of a pension plan. The number that they determine on what to pay you on the pension, that number goes up 7% a year, or 6% a year. But your actual cash is not. It, where, when the market goes down, people are really starting to question this. I had a lady come into my office one day. I said, Larry, I heard your little seminar there. I came to show you how wrong you are. I said, oh, this ought to be good. <laughs> So she shows me her annuity. I'm getting a guaranteed 6% on that. I said, uh, I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, but you're not. I'm, look, 6%. I said, I know, I see that. That's on the benefit base. That's not your cash value. I said, do you mind if we call them? Sure. So I called her up, and I said, this is Larry Dolan. I'm calling on behalf of Ms. So-and-so. Uh, she's allowed me to speak on her behalf. Yes, he can speak on my behalf. All right. Um, her, she initially vested 250000 Can you tell us what her... her Cash value is today about 220000 This was three years later. And she says, that can't be right. I'm getting 6% a year. Now she's mad at her, not at me. <laughs> but again, she was uh, misled and severely misled. So again, you've got to be able to trust the people that you're doing business with and know that they are, know what they're talking about. So I say follow the money. Here's another thing. Someone in the, the villages, he used to own two pizza parlors in Michigan, sold them a few years back for one and a half million dollars, moved to the villages to live the life, live the dream, or as we call it, Disney World for retirees. And he went to his broker and said, you don't think we're getting long-term care insurance. His broker said, you don't want to do that. It's real expensive, plus you've got enough money to self-insure. I wouldn't do it. I would just leave it alone. Okay, he didn't do it. Two years later, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. He eventually went into a nursing home. He was there for 13 years. That million and a half dollars, gone. Even though he was a millionaire, he had to go on, on Medicaid. His son was furious. He said, I'll bet you that advisor didn't want him taking money out of his investments and giving it to an insurance company. I hate to think that's true, but there's a financial incentive for him to keep that money in the investments and not let it take it out and put it in long-term care policy. So again, when people recommend things, don't recommend things, try and find out why. Because this, who's responsible for your financial well-being? You are. I mean, you can blame other people, but it's really up to you to be knowledgeable. A lot of people, uh, like David, are very knowledgeable about what to put in their bodies, what they eat. You need to be knowledgeable about what you spend your money on. Um, knowledge is key in the, this day and time. What does it mean to retire fearlessly? Retire fearlessly means your basic needs are covered, you're protected against a financial disaster, and you can take advantage of opportunities that make sense for you. You know, while we're working, we're saving up in that nest egg. When we retire, now we're in the distribution phase. You got to be have a distribution plan that makes sense to you. I'll give you an example. In 1973, if you took a half million dollars, 500,000, and put it in a balanced portfolio, that means about half bonds and half stock. That's a pretty standard portfolio. And you took out just 9% a year. That's only 45,000 a year. If you did that during those years, and that, those type of market returns, in 11 years, it would have been gone. That's not a good distribution plan. You don't set it and forget it. You have to be agile enough to respond to market conditions and make sure you take advantage of opportunities when they arise. Let me ask you something, Social Security. The other thing about distribution is when you start taking money out to live on it, that usually take, creates a taxable event, especially if you've got these IRAs built up for all these years. When, when you hit 70 and a half, there's something that you're going to become real familiar with called required minimum distribution. Now all those taxes you've been deferring for all those years are coming due. Do you have a tax policy? Social Security, let me ask you a question. Do you pay 
tax on Social Security? You better believe you do. A lot of people don't think so because you don't have to fill out a tax form to pay the taxes on Social Security. It's automatically deducted. Uh, isn't that nice of them? <laughs> um, but here's the thing. If you're single and you make over 25000 on your Social Security, you're, you're going to pay taxes. If you're uh, a couple uh, and you make over $32,000, you are going to pay taxes. How much you pay, though, is kind of up to you. What am I doing here? Here we go. It can be 50 to 85% taxable. Well, what determines the taxable rate on it? They're called provisional taxes. That means they're automatically deducted by the government. Social Security earnings, number one, municipal bond earnings. A lot of people think municipal bond earnings are tax-free, and they are, but not uh, Social Security tax-free. And adjusted gross income. Those are the three factors that go into determining Social Security taxes. So, it takes a tax now account for example, I met a lady a few years back, and I said, um, Hildy, when was the last time you took a really nice vacation? And, oh, Larry, it's been years. How would you like the government to, to, to pay for your vacation? I said, what are you talking about? What we did is we took money out of a mutual fund and put it into a tax-deferred account. That meant her adjusted gross income went down. She went from 85% taxable to 50%. She saved $2,800 a year in Social Security taxes. This from moving it from one account to another. Again, you got to take advantage of the opportunities when they come up. You can go on a nice vacation for twenty-eight hundred, and she did, and she's been doing it every year since then. So that we call it five steps to retiring fearlessly. Number one, growth. Why do we say growth? Here's the thing. People are living longer than they used to. Now that's plateaued in the last couple of years. But if you look 10 years ago versus today, uh, the statistic that just startled me, the average couple that retires at 65, there's a 50% chance that one of them will make it to 95. That's a 30-year retirement period. That used to be unheard of years ago. Well, if your money's not growing, you're going to run out of money during that 30-year period. You've got to make it last. The Wall Street Journal came out with a startling uh, article that said the average investor is five times more likely to outlive their funds than they are to lose them in the market. So you got to have growth. Now, does that mean you have to be reckless? Does that mean you have to take more risk than you want to? Not necessarily, but you do have to do better than inflation. What's inflation running right now? 2.25% last quarter. So you got to at least be doing better than that. Can you get a guaranteed rate better than 2.25? You, you do, but you can, but you got to know where to find them. Give me an example. If someone were to take a million dollars in cash and bring it to a safety deposit box and put it in there, and 20 years later, come back and take it out, and inflation was 2% a year every one of those 20 years. Well, they still have a million dollars. But you know what the buying power would be? A half million. Yeah. That's how much inflation can erode the buying power. So you better be making more than that. Growth is very important. Number two, guaranteed lifetime income. You know, when we were working, we were getting, used to getting a paycheck, right? Then when you stop working, what? You get Social Security. For most people, Social Security is not even close to what they used to make when they were working. So it sometimes makes sense to have a guaranteed income. Now, you can make withdrawals from your nest egg. The problem with that is that if you live long enough or the market doesn't do very well, at some point it can drop down to zero. And you've lost that income and that asset both. So there are ways that you can give yourself guaranteed your own pension because we know a lot of companies don't provide it anymore. But you can provide for yourself with an own, your own pension fund that's, that's tailored to you. Long-term care. I mentioned that earlier. Nothing can wipe out someone's assets quicker than a long-term care event. David, you and your business, you see it all the time. Yeah. Um, so I always recommend when you hit 60, you better consider a long-term care policy. Why 60? Because your chance of having a long-term care event before 60 are less than 1%. In your 60s, it goes up startlingly, in your 70s, even more age after that. Plus, if you're around 60, it's more affordable than if you wait till you're 75 or 80. Plus, these are normally determined by health, they're underwritten. So if you wait until your health declines, you probably won't qualify for a long-term care policy. Now let's say you can't have one for whatever reason, you can't afford it, or you, your health won't allow you to. You can, through financial and legal repositioning, you can position your assets such that uh, it will 
cut, the, cut your losses if you have to go on Medicaid. Now, that's not the best solution, but at that time you're just managing losses and trying to uh, hang on to as much as you can. Tax distribution strategy. A lot of people, this is the way they do their taxes. Uh, Mr. Accountant, here's my expenses for the year. These are uh, my income for the year. Please determine my taxes. And they'll come up with whatever they come up with for that year. We recommend a proactive plan that for year after year, make sure that you pay the lowest taxes possible. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you should illegally not pay your taxes. What I am saying is pay the, the least amount that the government allows. You know, the Bible says, render it into Caesar what is Caesar's. But I always say, but not a penny more. And then number five, the legacy. I say, put that in there because there are folks in the villages who will surprise you. They look like they're doing very well. I start talking to them. They're living like paupers. I say, what's going on? You got all this assets here, this cash here. Why don't you spend some of it? Well, we're saving it for our children. So what happens? They don't join the country clubs. They don't buy the new cars. Then they die and their children get it. They join the country club. They buy the new cars. <laughs> um, here's what I recommend. Have a deliberate plan for your, leaving a legacy. And have that plan, uh, an asset put aside, just for that purpose of leaving for your children. First of all, it'll grow faster than if you commingle it with your other funds. And have that, don't mix Peter with Paul. And then the rest of the money, spend it. Enjoy your retirement. You're in the villages. Take advantage of it. So those are the five steps to retiring fearlessly. Most people that I've spoken to have maybe two, three, or four, some of them four. Very few have five of those steps covered. They're always leaving a, a, a weak spot, blind spot. But if people will follow that guideline, they'll live the retirement of their dreams. And have someone guiding you that you trust and that's competent. That's it.